The Kirby-Bauer disk diffusion method is perhaps the simplest way by which a microbiologist can determine the susceptibility of an organism to antimicrobials. The principle of this method is that antimicrobials contained within filter paper disks diffuse out from that disk, setting up a concentration gradient, whereby the highest concentration of the drug is immediately adjacent to the disk, and it decreases as we move further out. Organisms are able to grow until they reach a concentration at which their growth is inhibited, resulting in the generation of inhibitory zones. The diameter of these inhibitory zones can be categorized as susceptible or resistant by comparison with a standard interpretive criteria. There's a number of factors that are really important to standardize when performing a disk diffusion test to ensure that the susceptibility test results are clinically predictive. You must use a fresh, pure, overnight culture. The inoculum density must be McFarland 0.5. The incubation temperature, time, and atmosphere are all standardized, as is disk content. Media composition, including the type of agar, Mueller-Hinton. Plate thickness and freshness are all very important, in addition to specific components, such as sodium chloride, divalent cations, and glucose 6-phosphate in the case of phosphomycin susceptibility testing. Finally, quality control by including reference strains with well-established susceptibility profiles ensures uh, accurate performance of the assay. The first step in performing a Kirby-Bauer disk diffusion test is to make a suspension of bacteria in liquid. So we start by taking a sterile stick or swab and picking several isolated colonies uh, from our fresh overnight culture. Those colonies are then suspended in uh, sterile water. Um, you can see here we just rotate the stick along the side of the tube to try and uh, get all of those bacteria off. We then vortex our tube to ensure that that suspension is as homogeneous and, and uniform as possible before measuring its density in the densitometer. What we're going for is a suspension with a density of McFarland 0.5, and in this case we needed to add just a few more bacteria, which is totally fine. So there we've got it, and we're ready to now inoculate our plate. We do this using a sterile swab, um, we start by fu first fully immersing that swab into our bacterial suspension and then wringing out the excess liquid on the side of the tube. This swab is then used to uh, plant a lawn of bacteria over the entire agar surface. As you can see here, we spread the swab from side to side, rotating it, covering the entire surface of the agar plate. The plate is then rotated 60 degrees and that swabbing repeated and then that's repeated for a third time just to ensure that we have a homogeneous uh, lawn of organisms. We're now ready to place our antimicrobial discs. We remove individual discs from their cartridges using sterile forceps, which we then use to place each disc on the agar surface. In preparation for doing this testing, it's really important to take the discs out of the fridge or freezer where we commonly store them and allow them to warm up to room temperature. This ensures that the test will function appropriately. So depending on how many discs are being placed on the plate, um, you may need to be aware of uh, their relative placement to each other. You want to ensure that the inhibitory zones don't overlap um, making measurement um, difficult or impossible. Once all of our discs are uh, planted, the next step is to incubate the plate. We do that overnight at 35 degrees Celsius in ambient air. The following day, we're ready to inspect our plates and measure the zone diameters. Um, we simply do this with a ruler on the back side of the plate. Um, the inhibitory zones are quite easy to visualize and uh, and record the measurements. So by convention, our, our zones are measured in millimeters, um, which is what we then look up in our uh, interpretive guidelines to determine whether the organism would be considered to be susceptible or resistant. 
This is the online version of the CLSI guidelines where we find our interpretive criteria for susceptibility tests. And as you can see over here on the left, we have all of the different organisms we might be interested in listed. This is where we'll find each of our sets of breakpoints. So if we go to table 2C, you can see breakpoints for Staphylococcus. At the top of the guideline are all of the standardization criteria. So as I mentioned previously, the type of media, um, the density of, of suspension, incubation, temperature, time, etc. As we scroll through the breakpoints, you can see the various uh, interpretive criteria uh, by drug and organism. And we're just going to go down to the cephalosporins as an example. So here you can see um, our interpretive criteria for sefovacin, um, for dogs, for skin and soft tissue infections, for the organism Staphylococcus pseudintermedius. With a 30 microgram disc, a zone diameter of greater than or equal to 24 millimeters would be considered susceptible, 21 to 23 millimeters would be considered intermediate, and less than or equal to 20 millimeters would be considered resistant. Similarly, just to the right, we have our MIC interpretive criteria, where an MIC of less than or equal to 0.5 would be considered susceptible, one intermediate, and greater than or equal to two resistant. 